Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity to call upon thee, Lord, for, again, the opportunity to gather in the house of God around the Word of God, listen to the good singing, Lord, have the good fellowship, all that's done, we thank you for it thus far today. Fathers, we open the Word of God, Lord, and we do our best by the help of the Holy Spirit of God, Lord, to expound upon the Scripture, Lord, and deliver a message that will help. Father, I pray for me, God, first, God, that you'd help me. Lord, I pray forgiveness of sin. I pray for cleansing. I pray for a helping hand from God. Lord, that the truth of the Word of God might be exposed, Lord, to us today. And Father, we might feel a touch from from heaven, knowing we're on the, on the last leg of the journey, and the best is yet to come, but God, please help us to be faithful and stand for you until you come, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the children of Israel have, the, the uh, Egyptians have uh, declared to let the people of Israel go. After all they went through, they, okay, we're going to let them go. Now they have let them go, and this is part of the story here today. And the Lord spake unto Moses, verse number 1 of, of Exodus chapter 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel, God spoke to Moses. Moses was the deliverer. He was the one delivering the message. And he said, Speaking to the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pi-Haharoth, between Migdal and the sea, over against baal Zephon, before it shall you encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh... Uh, will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the, in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him, and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of the Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and the horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped him by the sea beside Pehiharoth before Belzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. They said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Now, that's their plight. That's what they're up against. And they go out with a high hand. They go out rejoicing. They've left the land of Egypt. The Egyptians say, what have we done? We've let our servants go. Now we're going to have to make our own bricks. Now we're going to have to do the hard labor. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. God allowed his heart to be hardened, caused his heart, because he knew that he was going to turn against Israel. And so after the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh said, we're going to go get him. We're going to go bring him back. The children of Israel leave. They leave Egypt, and they're going away. They're being, they're being led by Moses, and they don't know where, but they're following the man of God, and they know, and, and then they get out here, and they see that their back is up against the wall, so to speak. They find out that the Egyptians are following them or chasing them, and that they got their army coming with them, and they begin to moan and groan and complain. And he said, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And they believe because of what they are seeing, because of how bad things look, 
and because when they look around, all they can see is the terror of the Egyptian army pressing down upon them, and they take their eyes off God and think, well, we'd have been better off back there in Egypt rather than being here where we're going to be slaughtered by the Egyptian army. See, they came out of there. They had no, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's all right. Amen. They had no weapons. They came out of there with their cattle, with their children, with their sustenance, you know, what they what what the least they could gather and carry out of there is what they did. They had no weapons to to fight the army of the Egyptians, and they were at the mercy of God and at the leadership of Moses. But Moses had what? He had God, he had spoke to God, he knew God, and here's what Moses said. Very calmly, I believe that Moses turned and spoke to the people of Israel. Moses said unto the people, What? Fear ye not. Last week we preached on fear not. This week we see the same words, fear ye not. Now, these next two words have very significant meaning to me. Stand still. Stand still. Have you ever been around a fidgety young'un? Have you ever been a fidgety young'un? Have you ever been around a fidgety adult? Are you a fidgety adult or child? Has anyone ever told you, just will you just stand still a minute and let me talk to you? I've had those. I've, I've, I've been one of those at times, and I've had them before me where they, all they want to do, you know, is you're trying to tell them something, and they're flitting, flatting here. You know, they, will you stop just a minute? Just stand right there and let me tell you something. Oh, I'll tell you. You won't be still. I've got to tell you something. I can't tell you nothing. Will you interrupt in every sentence that I'm trying to tell you? Just stand still a minute and let me talk to you. And that's what Moses is telling the children of Israel. He says, fear not, stand still. And the man of faith, Moses, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. He said, you're seeing this army come after you, but you're not going to see them like this no more forever. You're not going to see that Egyptian army pressing down upon you because God is going to deliver. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. See, they had no weapons, had no way to fight, but God's going to fight the battle. Friend, we're living in the last days. The warfare that we face is of the, you know, is of the forces of, de- of, the, of hell and the forces of the devil and the force of the flesh, and the force of the world. And listen, we have not the means to fight that within ourselves. So we say, stand still. Let the Lord fight our battles for us. I, last, last night, I think it was last night, one, I, I was thinking, Lord, I get tired sometimes. Lord, I get tired. And I get weary, not, not just physically, but... Uh, you know, mentally, spiritually, most sometimes I get tired. And I remember these verses. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which God's going to do, which God's going to uh, fight your battles for you. And friend, if we live in the light of those words, stand still, wait on God, look to Him, wait for His deliverance, wait for Him to fight our battles for us. Our life as believers in these last days is going to be a whole lot better. Amen. Now, it's not going to take away the fight of the battle, but God's going to fight the battles for us, and he will if we'll allow him to. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speaking to the children of Israel, that they go forward, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, God tells Moses, and as far as I'm reading, God tells Moses, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them what's, you know, and hold your rod up and the sea's going to part and you're going to walk, the children of Israel are going to walk through on dry land and the heart of Pharaoh's going to be hardened and he and his men are going to follow you through and I'm going to destroy them in the Red Sea. What a, what a picture of the divine, you know, uh, when God just steps in and God intervenes and we see that and the children of Israel, all they had to do is follow God. Now, it looked terrifying to them. The Red Sea before them, wilderness on this side, wilderness on this side, Pharaoh's army behind them. They were trapped, had no place to go. 
but God, amen, but God was with them and God would help them and God would deliver them. I don't know how much faith the children of Israel had. They were following Moses. I don't know how many of them believed like Moses did, but Moses, the man of faith that he was, he raised his rod up to see departed. They went across and when the last last one hit the hit the shore on the other side, Pharaoh's army coming behind him, God let the sea roll back and kill them all. Amen. God is able and God will help us. God will fight our battles. But sometimes, you know, instead of getting so busy about everything we're doing, I get busy. I mean, I get busy about it. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. And this week I got to go do something. But I'm going to rest. I'm going to relax for just a couple of days. And I'm going to sit there on the side of a tree. And I may take a nap because I'll, put, I'll lock myself in. And I may take a nap if I want to. Amen. Dear no, oh dear. I may take a nap. But I'm going to rest for a couple of days and I'm going to let God speak to me and try to talk to my heart and try to get my attention. But we get so busy sometimes we fail to stop and stand still and listen to God. Now this word stand still. Now I'm standing still right now. Now that's not what the Bible's talking about. When the Bible here is talking about standing still. He's talking about standing still. Head up, chest out, paying attention, paying attention. And friend, that's what God's telling, telling the, the children of Israel, stand still, pay attention, and see what God's going to do. Amen! Now, that excites me just a little bit. And if it don't excite you, you need to stand still and just look and see what God's going to do. We look around the church in the last couple of years. God has done some things for Gabriel's Creek Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. I love the fellowship. I love the people. I'm in love with this church and you all. And God has done a work here and God will continue to do a work here as long as we look to Him. Amen. Amen. I'm, not a, I'm not crazy about... You know, I want to see the building full. Any preacher in his right mind wants all the people he can get to preach to. If there, if he's not, you know, if it's not in his mind for that, then there's something wrong with him. Amen. But I want all the people to listen. If I if I've got who God wants here, and if the church has got who God wants here, we'll have a time in the Lord, and we'll just have a we'll just have a good fellowship around the things of God. But we need when God's working and God's moving to say, God, give us some more. Amen. God deliver us. God help us. And God do more things and greater things here at Gables Creek Baptist Church. Amen. Listen, I'm looking for greater things. Amen. Are you? The children of Israel certainly were. They were looking for greater things. They suffered a great deal of, of heartache and disappointment in the land of Egypt. And they would suffered toil and strife and turmoil and had to work hard and all these things. You know, they were, their needs were being met. But there was better things out there for them. And t today, friend, I'll tell you, the church is doing well. God's people are doing good. So let's stand still and see what God else God's going to do for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to be shouting on my own here in just a minute. Look, friend, I'm looking for what God's going to do. Now we see some things here, and I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to give you three, <laughs> three things on up four fingers. What we see in these verses, number one, we see the terror of Israel and the courage of Moses. Now, I've been preaching most of that to you, so we're almost through part number one. Amen? We see Israel's terror, but we see the courage of Moses. Now, how would you like to be one man among millions? One man leading millions of people that were looking to him and trusting him for the right decision because he, they had trusted him to get him out of Egypt. He had, they followed him, and uh, they were following him. But we see that the terror of these people, again, where they see all the Egyptian army coming after them, they're up against the Red Sea and nowhere to go. We see their terror. <coughs> they were afraid. They were fearful. How many times are you ever fearful of things? How many times do you ever get afraid? I know people say, oh, I ain't afraid of nothing. I see these, bump, these, most of the time it's on young teenage boys or young adult boys. The vehicle says, I ain't scared. Give me a shotgun, amen. And I show them what scared is, amen. But listen, you, you know, and, and that's fine. That, you know, that's all right. I don't, I don't belittle that at all if that's the way they want to do it. That's good. That's good. They, they can do that. 
But I'm telling you, there's been times in my life when I've been afraid. I've been afraid and I've been fearful. There's times in my Christian life when I've seen things going on and I'm saying, dear Lord, I'm afraid. God, you've got to help me, God. You've got to deliver me, God. You've got to do something. Moses was him alone, him and Aaron. He was standing there around two million plus people and they were fearful, they were afraid and he had to be the calm one in the bunch. He saw the same things they did. He saw the wilderness on one side. He saw the wilderness on the other side. He saw the Red Sea in front of him, and he saw all the forces of Egypt coming after him. He was, he was looking at what they were. But in the, in, by the help of God, and because he had faith in God, he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God's going to do something here today. Even though you're terrified, God, look at God, look at him. Listen, you look at the world, and what's going to happen? You're going to get scared too. I, you know, they, these terrorist groups all over the world, all over the world, these terrorist groups all in our country haven't been showing their heads yet, but they will. And they're, listen, you look around, and, and, and sometimes it's a fearful world, but stand still and see the salvation of God. God's going to deliver. God's going to help you, his children. God will deliver, and God will help in these last days that we live in if we look to him. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your Christian life. If the news bothers you, don't watch it. If the news bothers you, don't listen to it. The Word of God will help you if you'll stay in the Word of God. And these last days, my friend, that we live in, before Jesus comes back, even though as challenging as they may become, God will deliver again. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We see the terror of Israel and the courage of Moses. They'd never, you know, they had, that had never been to war with Egypt, and uh, they didn't know what they were going to do. But we see Moses and his courage. He had faith in God. Why? Because he had been with God. He had experienced conversation with the Lord. He had been in training in the backside of the desert for 40 years for this moment, for this time, for this day, for this hour. So, God, so Moses had been in contact with God. He knew him. And so we see that his courage was because of his faith in God. How much faith do you have in God? How much faith do you, believe, do you have in God to believe that he will see you through and that he will help you in your life? People face battles. I don't know. There's a lot of people in this church this morning that's facing battles and heartaches and hardship. But I have never seen God fail one of his. God will never fail one of his. And you can rest assured at my words today that if you're facing something you don't know how to handle, God has never, never, never failed one of his. Now, there's things went on in my life that didn't turn out the way that I wanted them to. There's things that I've asked God to do and God hasn't done them. He's done something else, but God didn't fail me. He did what was right, and God will always do what's right. He will always do what's best for you and I. Fear not, amen. Have faith in God, believe in God, trust in God. God's going to take care of us. I, you know, I go to bed at night and I lay down and I go to sleep not, not fearful of what's going to happen when I wake up in the morning. Why? Because God's going to take care of us. And I, you know, these people have been all kinds of things. You know, we're going to have to do this or this. The country's going downhill. We're going to have to do this or, the, or this is going to happen. Or we're going to have, and if people get all, you know, all worked up. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still, have faith in God, believe in Him, trust in Him, and God's going to help us. Amen. Y'all with me today? This cold weather ain't got your brain froze, has it? Amen. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So we see that Moses had faith. He had been with God. He was calm in the face of danger. He said, stand still, hold your peace. Stand still, hold your peace. God's going to deliver us. God's going to help us. The Lord will fight your battles for you. And we're no match for the world, the flesh, or the devil. It takes God. It takes God in our life to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. It takes God to overcome Satan when he's attacking you from every side. And, and uh, when, How many of you ever get depressed? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. 
Yeah, about everybody in here. If you don't ever get depressed, man, I, I want to talk to you. I want to see what's happening. I'm doing something wrong. Well, once in a while I get depressed. You know? And for no good reason, for no, nothing going wrong, nothing seems, but sometimes, and maybe it's not depression, maybe it's just oppression of the devil. That old preacher Ray used to tell us this while he was pastor in our church. He was one of the most influential men that ever, that I was ever under as pastor. And I mean, there was, you know, that I sat under him, my pastor. And, and he used to say this, he said, sometimes it feels like an old slick, slimy feeling comes over me. He said, it is just the devil, and it's just the oppression of the devil just kind of trying to keep you down and keep you from getting your head up and keeping your eyes and things on problems that are really not problems at all as long as they're in the hands of the living God. Amen. Our problems don't amount to a whole lot if we turn them over to God. Amen. Insurmountable things to us are no problem for a God as big as I've got. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Have faith in God. The Lord will fight your battles. Give them to Him. Let Him fight them. If we're not strong enough. Let Him fight the battle. Then number two, stand still. <coughs> stand still and hear. Have you ever been around somebody that you couldn't get a word in edgewise? Don't nobody say my name or we're going to have... I've been around. I've been around people that, you know. I mean, blah, 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 blah. and if you had something, they'd ask you something before you had time to give an answer. Blah blah blah. blah they'd still going. Somebody come to somebody's mind right now. You're thinking about it, <laughs> Sister Betsy. She's back there. She's her mind's going a thousand. But she says, "I know who he's talking about." It ain't you, Sister. Amen. But no, I've been around, and, and I'm looking over the crowd. I ain't been around nobody in the church like that, but I've been around other people, especially at work. And all you want to do sometimes is to get them by the shoulders and say, Hush, God give you two ears to hear out of and one mouth to speak out of. Use these more than you use this, and you'll have less problems in life. You can quote me on that too, by the way. Stand still and hear. In, ver in Numbers chapter 9 and verse number 8, Moses still speaking to the children of Israel. They have been delivered. What God said he would do at the Red Sea, God had done at the Red Sea. What God said he'd do to provide for the children of Israel, he had been providing for them. Amen. God, Whatever God says he's going to do, he'll do it. Amen. All because they stood still and looked at God and listened to God. Numbers chapter number 9 and verse number 8. And Moses said unto them, what? Stand still. Again, Moses says, stand still. wonder how many times Moses had to tell that bunch to stand still. Boy, he had a rough job. You're talking about a, you talk about a man of faith, a man of courage, and a, a, a man that was tough. He was tough. But here again, we find him saying, all right, people, listen to me. Stand still. Attention. Stand still. Now he's telling them to do something else. Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Moses said, y'all stand still and let me listen to God for a minute, and I'm going to hear what God's going to say and God's going to command for you to do. Just stand still and listen. God sometimes has to get our attention so that we will hear from him. And God knows just how to get our attention so that we will hear from him. God's had to get my attention several times in life, but I remember one particular instance in when that I, I was complaining to God because of an unwise use of my time, which was my fault and not God's. I was complaining to God, Lord, I don't have enough time for this. I ain't never going to complain about that again. I promise you, I'm not going to complain. And I say sometimes I don't have enough time, but I ain't complaining. Amen. God knows what I need to do, and I try to follow him. But I was complaining, Lord, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I don't have much time. And this was before I was pastoring, and I said, Lord, and, and I don't know why I need, just need some, God, I need some more time. 
Shortly after that, I was laid up with a broken ankle for about eight weeks. And when I came to from all the surgery and the pain and all that mess there, and I was laying there on flat on my back because I couldn't lay on my side. My leg was, my ankle was broken and, and uh, you know, had uh, 50 pounds of cast on it or whatever it was. And I'm laying there and I'm all by myself and I don't even know if I ever told my wife this or not, but you're fixing to hear it this morning. And I laid there on my back and just as sure as I laid there, God said to me, now you've got time. I said, oh my, be careful what your complaints are. And so what for me to do? I'm laying there. My wife isn't working. She's working a part-time job. How many kids? Two kids? Yeah, we just had two. And God said, now think about it. But you know, God saw us through that whole thing. I learned something, though. Be careful what you complain to God about. God's liable to give you what you want. And I said, Lord, I need a little more time. God gave me eight weeks that I tried my best to spend studying too. A big part of that time I tried to spend reading the Bible and studying. But listen to me, friends. Sometimes when we get so busy that we don't know what's going on, we need to stand still and listen to what God's got to tell us to do. Church, we stay busy as a church. One of the best things a church can do, I believe, in my, in, in my experience, one of the best things a church can do is to stay busy doing something. And listen, we stay busy doing something, but God's always directing, God's always in it, and look how God's blessed. Amen. But once in a while, we need to just stop and stand and say, Lord, is this what you want for me? Lord, is this what you want for me? And I stop once in a while and say, Lord, is this what you want for the church? Is this what you want for the people? God, is this message? I want to listen to you, Lord. I want you to tell me. God, is this what you want me to preach? If I don't have the go-ahead from God, I'm just not going to do it. I, I, would, I would walk up here in this pulpit if I didn't think I had a message from God. I, and I've seen it done before. I've never done it, but I've seen it done before. I... I would walk up here if I didn't have a sure message from God and I'd say, I don't have it today, friend, and I'm not going to make one up. Let's stand and be dismissed. Now, so far, that's never happened. But I want to be, be in touch and in tune so that I can give to you what God wants you to hear. I want to stand still and, and listen to God and say, Lord, what do you want me to preach to him? Lord, help me to stand still. Moses said, stand still. When God speaks, we should listen. How does God speak to you? Through the still, small voice of the Spirit of God <coughs> and through His Word. If you'll read His Word, the answers to your problems are in the Word of God. And it may not come as you expect, but they're in the Word of God. If you'll read the Bible, your answers to your questions are there. He speaks through his word in a still, small voice. Sometimes you and I, sometimes you and I need to stand still and hear what God's got to say to us. This, we're coming up on a busy time of the year. And already, already the Christmas trees are out and, and the Christmas lights and decorations are being sold and the gift, give, the gift buying has already started. But we need to, this coming upon this Christmas season. It's approaching fast. When we do our drive through, we need to say, every one of us in here needs to be praying, God bless our drive through. God bless this drive through pageant this year that somebody might see the truth and get saved by the grace of God. Sure, there's a lot to be done. We'll be busy getting it all done. But while you're getting it done, be praying, Lord, bless. What's going on? Bless what I'm doing. Bless this prop that I'm putting up. Bless this building that I'm putting up and help me to be faithful to you while this is going on that someone might come to know the Lord. Amen. Stand still and hear what God's got. Then, number three, and I'll be through. Stand still and consider the works of God. God brought them through. God brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea. God brought them 40 years through the wilderness and they never got hungry. God fed them. God clothed them. God let the shoes on their feet last for 40 years. 
stand still and consider the works of God. Stop once in a while and think, Lord, what have you done for me in my lifetime? And if you begin to write them down, you'd never be able to write it all down. What God has done for you, what the works of God have done in your life. Job says this, Job chapter 37 and verse 14, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Stand still and consider what God has done for you. What's God done for you? Has, God, has He done anything special for you? Saved your soul from hell? That's a wondrous work of God when you saved your soul from hell. You think of all the personal benefits of being a Christian, of being a child of God, of being able to go through this world worry-free if we trust God. That's a benefit of God. That's a wondrous work of God that God delivered. We're living in the last days, but the most exciting times that I, that I know of we could live in is today and now. Friend, I believe we're sitting in the building tonight and this morning and I believe with all my heart that we're here to see the rapture of the church and to see the bride of Christ called out by the Savior. Amen. Looking for Him any time, any day. We're living in exciting times. May we see that wondrous work of God ourselves when He calls the bride out. Might we be the generation to see the Lord when He comes back in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and snatches us out of here, amen, raptures us from this place, the wondrous work of God in the rapture. We will see, without a doubt, we will see the day when the Lord comes back in glory and in His revelation revealing Himself to the world and commanding and leading and ruling and bringing peace to the world. That's a wondrous work of God. Many other wondrous works of God that we see, we look at, you know, you can look in nature and see the wondrous works of God, the wondrous acts of God. You can look out and see the beautiful, uh, the beautiful trees as they turn color, and you can see them white with snow. Who would ever think? But it's a wondrous work of God. You can stand at night and see the stars in the sky and wonder why God laid them out the way that He did. It wasn't haphazardly that God put the stars in the sky and the planets in the sky. He planted them, amen, by the Word of God. He planted them in place where they're at. And they tell me that a man knowledgeable about the stars can navigate the world without ever having a compass. I ain't that smart, but I believe that can be done. Old friend today, consider the wondrous works of God. Consider the wondrous work, last of all, of salvation in your heart, a wondrous work of God. You may be here tonight, this morning, and say, Preacher, I've never experienced that wondrous work of God in salvation. I've never been born again. I don't know who, I don't know about going to heaven. I don't know about anything except living my life, and when I die, it's over with. I talk to people like that. They just, they just say we're living our life and that's all we can do and, and we, don't have, we don't know what else is going to happen after this. This is going to sound kind of gross, but I asked a fellow the other day, I said, what will happen to you when you die? I said, what's going to happen? What's after this life? When he said he was ready to, he, you know, he, didn't, he was ready to go, but he wasn't ready to go. I said, what's going to happen to you after you die? He said, the worms are going to get me. That was his answer to my question. And I said, friend, it's not as simple as that. There is, there is an afterlife. To the lost man, it's death and hell forever and ever and ever. To the child of God, it's a life with Christ in eternity around the throne of God on the new heaven and the new earth and the new city, Jerusalem. And for eternity, we'll be with the Lord. That is a fact of the Word of God. And we consider these things, friends, the wondrous works of God. Has God done a wondrous work of salvation in your heart? Are you born again by the grace of God? Friend, if not, today's the day of salvation. Everybody bow your head. No one looking around for a moment. I'm through. I've, I've, I've been obedient to the Lord. I believe we've done what God said to do this morning. And I want to ask you this question. Do you know the Lord? How many of you in here without a doubt 